And the very determinateness, the bestimmtheit, the, the being determined. By the way, I had a, just a little bit of a digression here. What are these? These are suffixes, right? And we use suffixes like that to indicate a kind of substantive that is going on where we take an adjective or we take a verb and we turn it into a noun. And a noun is supposed to name a thing, right? But this is a thing about a thing. It's really a quality of the thing, the quality of determinateness. Insofar as it has determinateness, it's just like everything else that is determinate, that possesses determinateness. So we don't want to be seduced too readily by language into thinking that, well, it's got determinateness, so that must be something. Because what's going to happen is the thing, by examining what it means for it to be determinate, as we've just done in the previous uh, passages, is showing us to be no thing. Not a thing, at least in the sense of being something that can be totally independent of all of its relations with, with everything else. At least it doesn't have a, an essence at this point or being for itself. Um, we saw that it did, but its being for itself is mediated. So it's better to say not that it doesn't have any essence or that it doesn't have being for itself, but rather it doesn't have it simply. It doesn't have it per se. It doesn't have it the way that we wanted it to, to have it. We've experienced something in there. Necessity means, quite often, you don't get what you want, right? And so consciousness is having that experience right now. now people do this in all sorts of ways. When they start thinking about, what is my legacy? Uh, this is kind of a, a digression, but it's worth thinking about in, in terms of this, this passage. When a person thinks about their legacy, they, they typically say, what am I leaving behind? Right? And they tend to focus on achievements. Achievements are things that our activities bring about. Or they focus on the example that they left, their existence and their activities. Right? Or they focus on something a bit more vague, you know. I improved my, my city. I left behind children who were well raised. Now, that's all very well and good. But why does that legacy matter? I mean, think about this. If you're leaving behind, it will take children for an example. So you raised some good children. Or you were a teacher and you raised, uh, you elevated some great students to the level of being professors themselves. Well, who cares? I mean, what is their value? Well, they had some great students as well. And they had some great students as well. And pretty soon, if you do that long enough, you start to see that this chain is just a chain of things that ultimately don't have value and purpose in and of themselves, but only in relation to something else. So, for example, Socrates. Why did Socrates matter coming into being and in the activities that he engaged in? Well, he was the teacher of Plato. And Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. This is the sort of stuff we tell each other in history books and when we do preliminary lectures, right? And then Aristotle, well, I don't remember who he taught, but, well, Theophrastus. Theophrastus. And then people are like, Theo who? And you start to see that it doesn't really matter unless there's something intrinsic that these guys connected up with. Well, what is that? That's something eternal, something unchangeable. A lot of times people want to, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a digression here, but it's kind of important. When we talk about idealism, idealism has come to mean something quite different in, in modern parlance than it did in, you know, uh, you know, earlier times when Hegel was, was using and taking the term, you know, from others before him, like Kant, for example. Um, and a lot of people associate it with a kind of, you know, fuzzy-headed, uh, you're living in the realm of ideas, you're not practical, you're not grounded in, in things that really are, you know, like, like books or, or neckties or chalkboards, things that you can touch, things that you, that you can say facts about, right? And what we forget in that, this is really one of the great insights of the Hegelian philosophy, is that ideas are also realities, 
Ideas have to be drawn out. The notion, you know, when it first comes on the scene is not fully developed. But ideas have a kind of power. You can unfold them into reality. And it's not just an application of our thought onto uh, reality. Our thinking is a real thing. Our thinking is itself part of reality. It's not something totally opposed to it or, you know, it's kind of sort of a hazy picture of it. Um, the four consciousness has some in itself to it. And so Hegel is insisting that we, we recognize this.